and uh, the community itself has fast become friends to family, and it's been a really cool opportunity to see the support and the culture that Bert's cultivated to the the support and the compassion and the vulnerability that's showed up here. Obviously, you see it as the speakers go, even the introductions go, um, but it's no, no mistake that Dr. Serrano uh, is in this community. Um, I've had the luxury of knowing him for 16 years. He's, uh, he's become a father figure to me, but if you do not know him, his capability is off the charts. His compassion is off the charts. Um, I'm not going to name drop people for him, but he's formulated supplements for some of the biggest companies, Beverly International, Muscle Farm. Um, he's been uh, running a family practice for 30 years where I've seen him solve some incredible problems. People come into his office with stacks of paper, um, stacks of tests, been to every other doctor under the sun, and he does something that a lot of doctors don't do, is they, he asks if you're happy, he looks at your blood work, he does everything under the sun before he starts get dealing out medication. He's an incredible problem solver. Um, and if you do know him, he has one of the biggest hearts in the business. His passion for helping people never stops. And he, he taught me really young that help and support are not yours to keep. He constantly gives back. He constantly learns. If you have been around him, he's either reading a thousand page book on brain trauma or fats or B12 vitamins or he's playing Farmville on his phone. He, he it may, it might put him on the spectrum in some capacity, but his, his, his knowledge is out of control. Um, I ask that when you do listen to him speak, um, be open-minded. He's absolutely destroyed some... I've, I've been told to have surgery by 15 orthopedic surgeons, and he's, he's kept me out from under the knife every time. Um, and he, he goes against the grain in some of the things he does, but when he does speak, especially on topics like this, um, please open your mind and understand the power of... Um, what not only medicine can do, but answering all these other questions in your life um, and then addressing things without uh, medicinal intervention and those kind of things. But um, he's sometimes hard to understand, but he's super easy to love, uh, Dr. Eric Serrano. Thank you. Um, I, I was going to dedicate the lecture to John Meadows and... Louis Siemens, uh, both of them were my patients. So this year I've been rough, a little rough, because I lost a few people. Uh, but I'm going to dedicate it to Leslie and Anita. Because, damn it, I got spoiled this weekend. <laughs> and um, they treat me awesome. Um, Leslie, I don't know where she is. Also, I got something to confess. Where's John? John, stand up. John slept with me last night. <laughs> so... <laughs> I love to piss people off. The reason I like to do that is because you, when you make somebody angry, they want to come at you and deliver what they're thinking about you, but also they tell you the truth in a moment. Now, when I started, I was going to make you guys angry and piss you off, make you tense, and at the end of the lecture, I'm going to make you relax. I'm going to start with some things is everybody happy here, first of all? Is everybody happy? Yes. I like that. Okay, now if I ask you guys what will make you more happy, what would be the biggest answer do you guys think I'm going to get? If I go one by one and I ask you each of you guys what would make you more happy, what would you think will be the biggest? I don't want to go ask you right now and put you up here. By the way, everybody I sit on the front screw up because I'm going to use you for something. So I want to know, if I ask you guys what will make you happy, what would be your answer? Okay, here's a big one, bigger muscles. I like that. That's stupid as hell, but that's okay. I take that one. Okay. Uh, what other answer? Money. I like that answer. Money. What would make you happy? Money. What happens if I tell you if everyone got paid the same amount per hour, what would you do? If everyone in this room will get paid the same amount per hour, what would you do? Will you be doing what you do now? Oh, I like that answer. No. That means you guys are not happy. Okay? That means you guys are unhappy. I like that answer. Now, money can buy you a clock, but no time. Money can buy you books, but no knowledge. 
Money can buy you medicine, but not health. A bed, but not a good night's sleep. Sex, I like that one, but no love. Companionship, but no friendship. Blood, but no life. And a position, but no respect. I want you guys to think about all those right there. In my office, I have a lot of people from all, I would say, spectrum. Very rich people, billionaires. Very, very poor people. I tend to charge a lot when you're rich, and I try to not charge you when you're poor, right? Now, my definition of poor is different than your definition of poor. Now, I want you guys to think what I just put there, because you guys want that money, do you think? Now, everybody here must have a purpose on life. Now, if I ask, what's your purpose, and I go one by one, I say, what's your purpose on life? Okay, I'm going to ask, give me an idea what your purpose on life is. Anybody volunteer here? Provide them for your family. Okay, what else? Serve others. I like those altruistic components of it. Now, a purpose always has to have three rewards. Psychosocial reward, a physical reward, and a spiritual reward. If your purpose doesn't have those three things, It's empty purpose. You're, you're not going to be happy. Again, we're back. Most people tell me, oh, I want to make more money. Most people tell me, I'm going to, oh, I'm going to be bigger muscles. Well, that's a big purpose right there. Okay? So what is your purpose? Tell me. Now, when you tell me what your purpose is, if your purpose doesn't have those three scenes, those three rewards, you're going to be unhappy. You're going to get up every day. What am I going to do today? Okay, I don't like that. I want you guys to get out of here with a freaking purpose. What is my true purpose? I want you guys to think really hard. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. And I want some answers. I'm going to start poking at you. Okay, remember, I like to piss people off. If you can change three things in your life, what would you change? I am the magic genie Puerto Rican with an accent, and I can confer you any freaking wish you want If you have three things to change in your life, what will you change? I want an answer because I'm going to start pointing. More time, less pain. Okay, which are decent answers. More time. I cannot do that. Okay, but it's interesting that we actually say, I want, they think and think and think, and sometimes they don't have an answer. And when they don't give me an answer, I said, then your life is not bad. Okay? Your life is not bad at all then when you do not want to change anything. But when you want to change something, then freaking do it. You have to make the change. Like Dr. Stone said out yesterday, you got to make that change. Okay? I want you guys to think today about purposes. I want you to say, okay. I got five children. All of them are grown up. Okay? I did beat the shit out of my children. I did, right? But, but, what a second. Let me finish. Let me finish. In my family, I have a set of rules, convictions, and values. I put the definition there based on my opinion, right? Not on your opinion, but my opinion. My oldest, actually, the The moron that was here talking about me, he's like one of my kids. He's always at my house, irritating the shit out of me, by the way. My oldest is a nurse practitioner. My second was the head of genetics at Pfizer, DNA. My third one is a vet. My fourth one is a nurse. And my son is in the military. I don't want to say that too loud here. So I didn't do too bad. They're doing amazing. But I had a set of rules, convictions, and values. How did I do that? When we ate dinner, you have to sit your ass on my table. We'll go all eat dinner together. You're not going to be watching TV. You're not going to be doing this. You're not going to be doing that. Dinner time was freaking dinner time. Your ass will be sitting on my table. Why? Because that was the moment that they would cheat on each other. Uh, Melissa did this. Oh, Jessica did this the other day, right? And that's when you listen to your children. Now, Coach... Sheldon was talking about the media. I ain't no media. I, 
Brian make fun of me because where's your Instagram? Have you ever looked at my Instagram, Brian? I, I don't even know. I mean, there's people writing me. I have no idea what it says. or I don't even know how to do Instagram anyway. But, you know, I don't have Facebook. I don't got shit. I don't have time to do that. Why? Because I'm always doing something. Now, this is from a book from John Wooden. The reason I put this up here is because the, the guy that wrote the book, I told he's a friend of mine, and I put that there because I saw the were kind of golden rules. Now, I gave you some slides that you can you guys get. I want to talk about stress, and I'm going to move fast because then I want to piss people off again. When we think about stress, most people think about one thing. I'm stressed because of this. I'm stressed because of that. In my office, I have to deal with a lot of stresses, right? And I know I'm going to make you guys think because one stress affects the other stress. And one stress affects another stress. I differentiate stress in a different way that you guys do. There are chemical stresses. And you guys are going to go, chemical stresses? Well, let me see. I see some people drinking some stupid energy drink here. That's a toxin. That's a chemical stress. So you're affecting your body the way you're not supposed to. Now, diet is a chemical stress. If you eat shit, you feel like shit, that's a chemical stress, which will affect how you behave later. Physical stress. I know that you say it's working out. Oh, amazing. That is a stress, but if you go work out and then you have to go home, uh, you have to go to work and work at hammering, working at something that is physically, it's a stress. If you're physically abused, it's a stress. Okay? Number three, here we go, the money, economics, it's a stress. If I ask my patient, you got to eat organic. Well, shit, can I afford that? No. So I got to be aware of that. I got to ask that patient, what is stress do you have? Can I help you? I might be able to, char- I might, I might be able to say, I don't want to charge you. I can't help you that way. But you got to show me that you want to change. Religion is a huge deal. I was raised Catholic. I went to a Catholic school. My kids went to a Catholic school. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. I do not believe in organic. My wife is not here. Organization. Organized religion. Because they use God as guilt. And guilt sometimes is massive. Huge. And I have to learn how to deal with patients like that. Next one. Social. If you're married, you're stressing 50 times more. (laughs) Wives. (laughs) <laughs> okay, wife make you and control you. Wives are so controlling. And the biggest way to control you is through sex. When you're younger, they don't want to give it to you. Then you get to be my age, and I don't want it that often. Oh, I want it more, honey. Where are you? Oh, shit, now that I'm old, like a Cali, like, you know, I cannot do it. You know? <laughs> So, be aware of that. Location. Why is location a stress? <laughs> and brown skin. Ooh, that's, that's new, right? Have you ever seen a brown skin on snow? I mean, I went to ski one time. Why? Because my wife made me. <laughs> I'm never fucking doing that again. <laughs> and the last one is genetics. I know you guys, I see a lot of autism, and I see weird cases with weird diseases, so I have to learn genetics. Can I change those? No. But genetics is like a freaking computer. You have the hardware. That means that you have a mutation. But what you freaking do with that hardware by putting a software, that's what you're going to get. Be aware of that. Questions? Nothing. Okay, I like this. Now, like I said, I want to put a little things here so you guys can take it home. I put a straight line here. It says past and future. If you live on the past, you're depressed. If you live on the future, you're anxious. It's called present because it's a freaking gift. Don't try to look beyond where you are. Look where you are. Later, you might want to do that, but use your gift. And because I have to hurry up, I want to give you something to take home right now. 
I have a pile of life. I call it the pile of life. And the reason I call it a pile of life, because those are the four most comprehensive things that you actually truly need. Even if you don't know you need it, you need it. And I'm going to put it here. This is my pile of life. God, health, family, economics. I use this pie, this pie to destroy. In my practice, I have five billionaires, okay? Which you're supposed to be happy. You can wipe your ass with money, right? Okay? But I'm going to tell you how. Now, this is divided in four pieces that are equal. They are not equal. You got to think what you're doing. They're not equal. Why? Because this pie is going to get smaller because I have family, I have friends that are like family. Amplifies your family. I got friends. I don't have anybody left. I'm the only child, so my parents are both gone. The biggest death that I ever had, my father was my best friend. And I have friends that are like family. Bert bothers me at least once a week. Okay? But I actually enjoy it. Brian bothers me every fucking day. Health, nutrition, and exercise or fitness. So that pie got smaller because you need to eat good to feel good, but you also have to move. You were meant to move. That's why movement, like Coach Sheldon said, creates what? Health. Economics. This is why I'm going to, people think a lot about this. Well, education creates a better job. And the more I know about my job, the better my economics is. So if I'm going to pick whatever job I'm going to do, I'm going to give it 100%, but I got to be educated for that job. Now you see, which one is the biggest piece of pie? Now you guys understand, God and family. Without it, I'm telling you, I'm going to tell you why. I have a patient, shows up in my office, 6'4 guy, white guy, I walk in the room and he starts bitching about his family. He said, I just flew from Italy and I bought my son a house in Italy and a Lamborghini. I'm not making this up. And then he goes on to tell me how his three sons are gay and they don't talk to him. And how he bought these things for them. How for his birthday he bought in a bow. How for, and I'm, he kept I haven't asked him a question. And then I asked him, ask me what my dad bought for me that I remember. He looked at me and said, what did your dad buy you for that you remember? A G.I. Joe. I don't know if you guys, you guys are too young, but a G.I. Joe. Actually, had little hair, you know, looked like Bert, you know. <laughs> and, you know, had the Kung Fu grip. I still have it, actually. And the guy looked at me and said, who ca- who?" He said, who cares? And I said, you spend all your damn time buying shit for your children. How much time do you spend with your child? He looked at me, said, yeah, you buy all these things. Oh, I bought him this for the birthday, but how much time? Now, my dad, you know what my dad gave me? The best thing he gave me? Memories. We went fishing. We went jump off cliff. We would jump off. We, went, we did all kind of shit together. Now, that I do not forget. Toys? I bet you guys forgot what toys you had. You don't remember one toy that you have. The guy looked at me, got up, and I told you he's 6'4", his nipples were on my eyeballs, right? <laughs> All pissed off, pushes me out of the way, and said, I want my money back. I told my staff, yeah, I gave you the money back. I said, I'm never coming back. I don't understand, you know? Three months go by. That guy shows up back at my office. And I said, and by the way, I always have a dog with me. My dog will eat you in a second if I tell him to eat you, by the way, in my practice. I got to deal with some nice people sometimes. And the guy sat there and, and calls, says, I, I want to tell you this. Nobody has ever talked to me the way you talk to me. I sat for three hours in your parking lot because I wanted to beat the shit out of you. But you never came out. 
<laughs> I, I, didn't know, I didn't know he was waiting for me, of course. And I have, I have my dog. You can try. Meanwhile, you're dealing with my dog. I'm beating the shit out of you with whatever. So he started crying, and he asked me for an apology. And I said, that day, I went back on my plane. I flew back to Italy. I canceled my son's house. I canceled his Lamborghini. I said, you need to spend more time with me. This guy, having been spending no time with his children, he said, on the last two months of my life, my child, two of my children, one of them is working for me now. We're spending time together. The other one actually moved next to me. And my son that I bought the Lamborghini, bought the house, doesn't talk to me anymore because I canceled all that. It has been now five and a half years, six years. All the kids are talking to him. The son came back and apologized. But now he's spending time with his family, which is interesting. Now, now that I give you a little mental thing to think, I'm going for the physical thing. And that's what's going to require some victims. So I'm going to move this out of the way. Any questions about anything that I said here today? You can ask me anything you want to. You can ask me about COVID vaccines. You can ask me about anything you want. Nothing? No questions? Okay. Who has very, very strong hamstrings here? Dude, I have all these fat ass lifters here. Nobody has strong lift. <laughs> oh, I got it. I like the guy with the pink shirt, but I'm going to use this guy right here. Okay. What is the most common use hamstring exercise? Leg curls, right? Now, if you're walking, do you tell your leg, I'm going to bend your leg now. I'm going to bend my left leg. I'm going to bend my right leg. I'm going to... Do you guys do that or not? No, you do it unconsciously. Most of the training involved on hamstrings is done through actions, thinking about it, and then doing it. Now, he said he has strong hamstrings. He said that himself, right? Not me. Okay? If I was with my wife, right? This is going to involve sex, right? Because, you know... That's what I want to say. Don't, don't be scared. I'm not going to, I, already had, I, I already had sex with John this morning. Okay? okay. Uh, I want you guys to be aware of things that you can do by yourself. And I'm going to give you some tricks today. I also want one of those hammers. What is the hammer thing? The mace. But I want the lightest freaking, I'm old, so I want the lightest hammer you can get me. Lay down on the floor. Face down. <laughs> this is, I seen Dr. Oh, Connor said, this is the sex part. I'm going to enjoy this. Okay. That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> I see a lot of laughing bullshit. Oh, I can't wait to bring a big guy here. Okay. You guys have, <laughs> on him, okay, do a curl for me, okay? Now, can you take, let me take your shoes, this is part of sex, right? I got to take his shoes off, fill him. He gets me oil out, so we got to warm it. <laughs> okay, sorry, I got to take your socks off, too. Oh, what the hell? <laughs> Dude, this, this dude's feet are freaking yellow, I'm I'm scared of touching that shit, but I have to. Okay. When you're training a person that is injured, I want you always to start with no movement. If you go to a doctor and you break your ankle, what do they do? Immobilize it. Okay? If you tear your hands in, what do they do? Immobilize it. Okay? I like that idea. I don't like how they do it. So bending your hamstring is nothing. Now, if I tell you, and everybody can do this on their own right now, if I tell you that your toe controls your hamstring, will you believe me? Let me repeat this. Does your big toe con control your hamstring? You're going to say, hell no. So okay. I'm going to prove you wrong today. The reason that the NFL players have so many hamstring injuries, and I like that because it makes me money, right? It's because they tape you. They have very tight shoes because you got to run, right? So what happens when you do that? What happens to your toe? Immobilize it. 
So then you create turf toe, which is the dumbest ass thing, and pay millions of dollars, but I cannot come up with a tennis shoe that allows me to do things. So this guy says that he has strong hamstrings. Okay, hold on a second. I got to put your legs together here for a second. The sex part is coming in a second. Hold on. <laughs> okay, I want you to bend your hamstrings as, as hard as you can. Harder than that. How, how much do you feel them? A lot. A lot. Only by bending the hamstring, so I have an injury here, it's a shortened position of the hamstring, he feels them a lot. He says he feels them a lot. Now, I rub his butt a little bit now, that's part of the sex part. Now, I tell him to plantar flex his toes. Now do it. Really hard. How much do you feel them now? Less. He said he feels them less. So he's cramping. Yeah. Uh, say that loud. Yes. He's cramping. Before he wasn't cramping, by using his little toe, his big toe, he said, I'm cramping now. I feel it less. Let me explain that to him. You cramping your hamstrings because you're bending your toe. Mm, I think this boy's going to have a hard time with what I'm going to do with him. Okay? So, go ahead and bend your hamstrings again and use your damn toes. No, the other way. Come on. Plantar flexion. Hold it really hard. He's cramping. Look at this. He's shaking. I'm not doing anything to him. I'm just making him bend his hamstrings. The reason is the plantar flexion, when you're walking, you're actually to use your toe to plantar flex and move forward. If everybody walks here and start plantar flexing their toes, you're going to move forward faster. Even if you don't intend to, if you guys all can get up and take two steps and you plantar flex with your toe, you will move faster. Everybody get up. Come on. You guys are sleeping. I, I hate that shit. Come on. <laughs> just right there where you are, Take one step, but push down with your toe. Tell me what happens. Can you guys feel it? Does it push it forward or not? It forces you to move forward because now you're truly activating your hamstring. So when you do hamstrings and you don't use your toe like most people do, what do most people do with their, with their feet? They do what? Dorsiflexion. You guys can sit down. Dorsiflexion, right? Because they allow the calf to help me do the hamstrings. Now, this boy, he said he's strong. I'm going to love this. Now I'm going to do have sex with him. So, okay? <laughs> Don't let me push you. Don't let me push you. Hold me. The dude's strong, right? Look at this. Okay? I want you, look what he did with his toes. What is he doing? For those people that can see it, he's dorsiflexion. Because it allows him to be strong, right? Now, plantar flex your toes, your feet too. Are you cramping yet? No. Okay, so you're not doing it hard. Yep. Oh, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. He's fr Actually, I feel his nice butt cramping under me, right? <laughs> so, don't let me push you down. Right. Hold me. Wait a second. You say you're strong, right? Just hold, just, you hold me. Okay, fingertips. Just a little bit. Okay? Oh my, he's cramping. Look at that. Now, remember what I told you that he's, I'm allowing him to control the exercise, but I hate when somebody else controls me. So I want you to plant our toes again. Hard, very hard. How much are you cramping? A little, a little bit. Now hold me. Don't let me push you down, right? Are you ready? Oh, shit. Oh. I. <laughs> I already have him moaning, right? Okay, hold me. Don't let me push you down. You got to hold me. Don't let me push you down. Ready? Are you ready again? Yeah. I'm going to push on your right, on your left leg. Are you ready? What the hell? Hold me. Unconsciously, he cannot hold me, but consciously, he can. Hold me. I'm going to use both legs. So he can hold me, right? But now, are you ready? <laughs> Hold me. Don't, don't let that toe go away. I can control any movement. He cannot hold me at all. He cannot do shit to me, actually. Look at this. If my daughter was here, I have to freaking lay on top of her, on, his, on her legs to be able to go down. I cannot put her down. I cannot put her leg down. This dude, look at this. Dude, this is like a fan. Look at this. And he's cramping. He cannot keep his toes. So that's exercise number one. Lay on top of the person, 
You can do a naked if it's your wife, right? And then I'm not going to teach you, but that will teach neuromuscular facility. Allows the brain to say, hey, if I'm going to fall, I'm going to run. I can manipulate one leg at a time without the need of me thinking about it. This guy can't. This is awful. This guy is going to get hurt. Look at this, okay? Um, questions about this. If your toe controls your freaking hamstring, what controls your pec? Get up because I'm going to make you do something. My sex partner here. Thank you. We'll have a seat. If you, if you talk, control your hamstrings, what are the thumb controls? The pec. I see people bench it thumbless. The only time that you do anything thumbless is when you're doing pull-ups or a pull-down machine on a straight bar. Let me repeat that for all those morons out there that I see. I was watching everybody yesterday doing pull-ups, right? When you use your thumb, you engage your elbow, which allows you to come to see me because you have elbow pain, because they tell you, that doctor tell you, oh, you have lateral epicondylitis or middle epicondylitis. You have tennis elbow, bushy. You have pull-up shoulder, pull-up elbow. Because when you wrap your finger on a machine or in a straight bar, your elbow becomes locked. Can you guys feel it? You wrap. You never do in a straight bar. Never, never, never use your thumb. You always go thumbless. Because the body was created to go up a tree. And unless you're a freaking gorilla or a monkey, you cannot wrap your fingers on a tree, can you? you have, how do you grab it? How do you grab a tree when you cannot do it? Thumbless. The reason is because God created us to do it that way. Now, if you're doing parallel chin-ups, you can put your thumb on it. But otherwise, don't use your thumb doing that. You have more power eccentrically. So you're training chest. You can lower more weight going thumbless that you can push weight. Have to be with your thumb. Try it yourself. Or even have a partner right now grab it. Push against the hand standing. If your thumb is up, you, don't, you cannot push him. Now, I want everybody to put your hand to your right. Simon says, everybody hand to the right. Right? I want your next person next to you to push your arm back. And don't let them push him back. It's like a slap, right? Don't let them push him back. Okay. How, how weak are they? Freaking weak, right? Now, wait a second. Now close that thumb, but before you close your thumb, I want you to put your hand on your chest. Concentrate on your chest, right? Feel the peck when you close that thumb. You should be able to feel it. Can you feel it tensing up? Now let your hand go on your peck and try to push your partner's hand back with your closed fist. Tell me what happens. Way stronger, isn't it? Okay, that's because the thumb control. So I'm giving you a little bit of tidbits. Now, remember I have this. Okay. <laughs> who, who truly? <laughs> Wait a second. The pink, where's the pink, pink, pink shirt with strong hamstrings back there. I want you. Who uses a stiff-legged deadlift here? Okay, so you're strong as a stiff-legged deadlift. Yes, sir. I love that. I love that. I love this. Do, do, do stay like a deadlift for me. Do it right there. <laughs> Harder than the other guy. High. Okay. <laughs> that is a great sti stiff-legged deadlift. How much do you feel your hamstrings? Somewhat. Somewhat. Okay, another thing components, remember I told you you have to use your toes. If you have a hamstring injury, you most eccentrically train your hamstring. But not with movement, but with very slow movement. I'm going to show you an exercise because I want you guys to take things back so you guys can use this. Now, he said he feels it, right? Now, that's freaking lightweight, right? Yep. 
Que do it again for me. So I, I just like to see you bend over. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. This is actually a perfect, I rarely see it because, turn this way. There we go. Do it again. The first, this time, wait a second. Come back up. If I truly want to use the hamstring, he's not doing it bad. I want you to, I'm going to put my finger on his hip. Go ahead and do it again. But push back your hip. Push back, push back, push back, push back. There we go. Look, he's shaking. And he's using that little bar. Are you shaking or not? I'm shaking. Ah, stand up, stand up. The reason he's shaking because actually truly using the origin and the insertion of the hamstring, which is what you really truly need. Now, he thinks that was hard. Remember, how much of that weighs? Just like four pounds. Four pounds. <laughs> now is when you're going to suffer. Great ass, though. Great ass. Come over here. <laughs> Turn around again. Let's do it the right way again. Okay? This time, I really want you to involve your hamstrings, but I do not want to hurt you. So we're going to use a four-pound thing. It's going to be 10 times difficult because the body has fascia that connects from the top of your head all the way to your toes. If you don't believe me, I'll prove it to you outside, any of you guys. I want you to do the same thing. Do it correctly. Put your ass back. But I want you to do this. Hold it above your eye level. Never changes from there. Go back again. Go. Go. Keep going. Keep. Okay. You guys see him? You see how he's shaking? Now, I want you to push down with your toes. What happens to your hamstrings? Do you see that? Now, only four pounds. I was able, and Brian is a witness, I was able to do 95 pounds holding on front, which is brutal. Now I'm freaking off. I'm not done yet. Hold on a second. <laughs> now we're going to go like Thor. There we go. Okay. I want it straight. There we go. I want you to do it slow and go. Keep going a little more, a little more. I want you parallel to the floor. Come on, parallel to the floor. Parallel to the floor. Damn it. There we go. Nice. That is hamstring activation. Do you feel them now? Oh, yeah. Okay. Come back on. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You do have strong hands. Um, any questions so far? For those people that have elbow pain out there, okay, and at least I've seen 11 people for sure that have elbow pain. Right? They might say, nah, don't. I go touch them and, oh, my God, it hurts. Okay. If you have elbow pain and the doctor injects your elbow, it's not going to fix it. And I'm sure some of you guys have gone through that. The reason is your lats do not work correctly. So, I'm going to love this one. Excuse me. I need to borrow this chair. Where's Coach Ivy? Oh, Coach, Coach, come over here. Come over here. Big black guy, you know. Rough. <laughs> A way to test your abs, I mean your lats, is very easy. I want a big black guy here so he can kick my ass, right? Now, the reason I want to teach you this, guys, so you use it, I want to give you stuff that you can take back with you. Now, coach, chest out like a big man, okay? You hold, man, you're strong. Bring, bring, bring your hand, bring your hand right there, okay? So, coach, I want you straight, and I want you to bring your axilla down to your hip. More on that. Come on, bring it, bring it down. Coach, come on. Are you okay, coach? Yes. It's cramping, isn't it? <laughs> okay, the reason is coach has been doing, you know, pull downs. So I saw him strong, pull ups, but the, but the origin of the lats is not being used. You guys got to use that because when you run, the only connection between the floor and your arms is your lower lats. So now I want to show you an exercise that is pretty stupid, but allows you to take pain away from your elbow and allows you to activate and also actually. Rotate better. 
And you guys don't believe me, you can try outside when I'm done here and try this exercise. Coach, I want you to do the same again. I want you them straight, damn it. Go bend more, a little more. Bring the axle. That's it. That's the coach. Okay. Coach, don't, don't be looking at me. Okay. Rough. I like look at that. Okay. So, coach, are you cramping yet? Stop. <laughs> okay. So, he's cramping. The reason he's cramping, you shouldn't cramp if you do that. You shouldn't cramp. I'm doing it right now. It shouldn't cramp at all. The reason it's cramping is because your upper lats are working, but your lower lats are not working. So coach is very big, so he should be able to keep me down there. So coach, go ahead, do the same. Go all the way down. Now all you have to do is grab the elbow. A little more, coach, a little more. Don't let me pull you up. Oh, coach, coach, don't let me pull you up. Come on. Don't make me look back, coach. Okay. <laughs> Dude, if you do that to me, you lift me off the chair. Let me do it again, coach. Come on, strong, coach. Come on. All the way down. All, the, all that single went down. Coach, you are being a wussy if you let me lift that up. <laughs> okay. Co- coach, come on. <laughs> he can. And I, uh, how bad are you cramping? <laughs> okay. So, thank you, coach. <laughs> okay. I got 10 minutes, right? And I was talking about Brian Peters eating my food, coming at my house at 6 o'clock in the morning. I have a sauna, and the SOB puts a freaking ice bath outside, sauna and, and uh, ice bath. Sun, at freaking 6 o'clock in the morning in my house. I don't even up, all right? But Brian has grown up to do amazing things. And remember, I make you tense. I make you guys nervous because I was going to pick up on you. Hey, Brian, come over here. Where are you? Come over here. Brian, in the last few years, I do make him read. I make him do things that he shouldn't be doing, right? But he's my experiment sometimes. And Brian has dedicated half of his life now at breathing and doing stupid stuff that I think is stupid, but actually really helps you. And I stress you guys out. Brian, I want you to unstress them. Do it for me. Unstress them. Okay. <laughs> your heart rate, which, I'm um, sorry. Can you guys hear me in the back there initially? Yeah, easy enough. Um, but initially, I'm going to just rip through your physiology and start. Can, I, can you clear the board real quick, Doc? Thank you, Pumpkin. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm being touched all the time. But, <laughs> um, but in, in essence, you can start controlling your system. And I think breath work is the lowest hanging fruit in human performance. I think it's massive and optimal performance. You can train VO2 max, um, you can increase lung capacity, a bigger breath, a bigger lung it, it is eventually a slower breath, which is a slower respiratory rate, and all you guys in the fighting world, in the military world, world all those things, uh, the, I get, if you can breathe less than your opponent, you're going to outlast them and you can fight longer, and that's the goal, and that's what we coach in optimal performance, but just like the weight room, just like everything in life, if you don't master the fundamentals, you don't have a fucking chance of optimally performing and optimally breathing or optimally lifting the weight, or whatever it ends up being. So I'm going to chop up the autonomic nervous system because the breath is what, the only thing you can control in the autonomic nervous system directly. But since I'm Dr. Serrano's Ijo Blanco, I'm going to use the whiteboard like crazy. But basically, the problem here, he already broke down stress for you, where it comes from, how you get it, how you choose to, choose to uh, view it in your perspective. So I'm going to break it down a sim- little bit simpler, that when you do have stress, you're in a sympathetic state. When you, when you don't or want to transition away and rest and digest, that's parasympathetic. So sympathetic is fight and flight, parasympathetic is, parasympathetic is rest and digest. And all these things, your, your physiology is a language to, to your brain. So that psychology is unresolved physiology. It shows up really fast when you start breaking down every language of your physiology and how your brain stem reads it. So in the simplest form, if everybody, want to take, take, if everybody wants to take a big breath in through your mouth, exhale, take another big breath in through your mouth, feel where it's going, one more time, big breath in through your mouth, 
what rises first? What moves first in your body? Your chest. Now following suit, take a big breath into your nose. Exhale. One more time. Big breath into your nose. What moves first? Stomach. Anatomically, mechanically different. Nose is uh, parasympathetic, mouth is uh, sympathetic. That's the first level of the language that you need to learn. So now, throughout the day, throughout, while you're sleeping, the first step we do with our athletes is we ask them, do you wake up with a dry mouth um, or do you wake up to piss at night? In essence, like, we're trying to figure out if they're a mouth breather at night. So are you staying in a sympathetic tone? Are you getting deep REM sleep? And all this breaks down to start the difference that shows up there in the chest um, the chest and the belly, or sorry, the chest and the belly is in essence, there's really only one benefit to the mouth is oxygen and CO2 in and out faster. If you, when you breathe in through the nose, it cleans, humidifies the air, has the ability to trigger nitri nitric oxide, the same thing we take pre-workout for the beetroot powder. You can, you can access that in, in through your nose. And the same, that lower breath that shows up mechanically, um, the best oxygen concentrations in the bottom of the lung. So already you're in massive, massive benefit. So now you need to become conscious. So a lot of what we preach is this level of awareness and now you know the difference between the benefits of the nose and the mouth. Now that's the first level because a lot of things in life trigger this sympathetic state. The human brain's not supposed to drive 80 miles per hour. Um, this human, the human brain's not, or the, the body's not to, meant to absorb these unnatural things. All these things trigger sympathetic states. And our body uses oxygen as an antibacterial, antiviral, anti-inflammatory. So a lot of things trigger mouth breathing. And that's where we want to start transitioning there. And so sympathetic is mouth. Parasympathetic is nose. Very super simple. Now, if everybody can find their pulse, find their, your carotid real quick. Take a big, massive inhale through your nose. Did anybody, else, did anybody feel anything? Yes. One more time. Get a good feel on it. Big, big full inhale through the nose. And then a slow exhale through the nose. What do we feel? Anybody got it? Yeah. Very simple. You have another tool now. The inhale is sympathetic. The exhale is parasympathetic. And you can extend the exhales. We're trying to give you control over your state. And that's the best thing that breath can do is give yourself control. Human beings hate not being in control. The negativity bias in the psychology shows up in uncertainty when you have attention on you in times of change, all these things. All the, all the, God, uh, all, all the stressors in life find these things and start stealing these tools. So now you have the nose and the mouth. Now you have the inhale and the exhale. And now you can start even breaking down the breath farther. Do you have sound to your breath? Sound is sympathetic. A quiet breath is parasympathetic. Can you keep the breath low with, with the nose? Can you keep it light? Can you keep it quiet? Because in essence, what end, once ends up happening, and this is where you can start controlling your state more and more and more, is if you just think of your respiratory rate and your heart rate as like a wind chime to the brain. And this is, and this is where the physiology becomes psychological. If you can basically control this wind chime, you can control your psychology. Because what happens, in essence, an oversimplification of the psychological or the physiological that's happening in the brain is as this accelerates and gets out of control, blood flows and leaves and regresses down the evolutionary chart. So just a really uh, base look at uh, your brain. In the back, it's your brain stem. Your lizard brain reacts to the environment. Very simple. Um, like snakes eat their young, uh, eat, eat themselves because they're snakes. That's what they do. It's not reactive. Then the middle of your brain is your limbic system. Uh, mammalian, we share with other mammals, territorial emotion, your reactions show up. And then the front of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, is the human gift. Problem solving, commun communication, all the above. What happens when this respiratory rate, this wind chime, gets out of control? Blood leaves the prefrontal cortex and goes through the amygdala and you become limbic and reactive. So the same essence, what's, if you ever argue with your uh, significant other and they're all worked up and you tell them to calm down, never fucking works. I got one thing. Who has reflux here? Come on, people. I know there's more than three people that have reflux. Thank you. Okay. One thing that Brian is talking about, I want to show this drawing here. This is your lungs and your heart for people who don't know. This is your diaphragm. The number one reason for reflux is what you're eating for sure, right? And the number two is your breathing. And the reason is 
When you breathe like most people, you breathe through your ribs and the diaphragm just moves that little. When you breathe with your belly, your diaphragm pulls down, pulls down the esophagus from behind and prevents reflux. So by you starting to breathe like Brian is asking you, you can resolve 70% of all the reflux. And I know a lot of people have a lot of reflux, especially at bedtime. That's because they eat, watch, I got to eat. I'm with my fat friend here, I got to eat as much as I can, right? And they keep breathing this way. But if you breathe the way Brian tells you, I bet 50% of the people that have reflux will stop. So that's one way to look also at it. Better nutrients, better breathing, because the blood creates, this creates negative pressure, and the blood flows to your heart and lungs, which it has to be at the basis. It prevents pneumonias. It helps you with your heart. It prevents heart attacks when you breathe because you're breathing correctly. Keep, keep going. Yeah, right. then, but there's, in the breath world, there's kind of three pillars where it's mechanical, where he's talking about the diaphragm and diaphragmatic breathing, not only as the diaphragm's like this umbrella, eventually you want to have access. The, the hardest thing is to become a 360 breather, and you can eventually open up space, and the, this culture is very ahead of the game. RPR, the breath belt, all, everybody's pushing the needle forward in the breath world. And if you become this functional breather where you can have this access, the, the diaphragm, yes, massive in respiration. But when you start looking at the mechanical nature of it, diaphragm, pelvic floor, their main job is uh, lining and stabilizing the spine. And so now the breath research is pumping out better and better now where if you can strengthen the diaphragm, if you can become a very functional breather, you become a more functional mover. So if your spine's stable and safe, um, the research on it is basically that if you uh, are a functional breather, you have an 87.5% chance of being a functional mover on the FMS test. And they, and they ran it on primarily athletes. But so now you get the, me me the mechanical benefit of it, you get the cellular adaptation where you're introducing um, carbon dioxide through more and more uh, slow breathing. And in essence, a way to look at it where I think people get breath work um, twisted a little bit or, or they're uneducated in the process is um, CO2 is the trigger to breathe. So if you put an oximeter on your finger, if you're, it doesn't matter if you're 400 pounds or you're 150 pounds, it's going to say 98%, give or take a percent, unless you have a pulmonary condition. The problem is not oxygen. Everybody has enough oxygen. And the problem with the mouth breathing side of it is you're actually bringing in too much oxygen. You're over breathing and slowly hyperventilating yourself. So what you want to do is find a way to introduce carbon dioxide. The best way to do that is transition through the nose. And the nose is going to show up for multiple reasons, not only just the better trigger of the diaphragm, mouth breathing, you can use, you use the diaphragm as well. But as you bring in that nasal breath, smaller, more restrictive, depending on the person, depending on the race and genetics, all these things. But the nose is obviously more restrictive, smaller holes, very, very simple logic to it. But as you inhale, that choice to breathe in through the nose develops a slower breath because of the, the restriction of the airflow, develops a stronger diaphragm, and introduces that, through that time, metabol or your meta metabolism in the cell is still continuing. Um, and there's going to be an introduction of a little more carbon dioxide. And how you get away from this overbreathing and get oxygen off the cell, what happens, how your oxygen gets delivered, red blood cell carries hemoglobin, which carries out 98.5% of your oxygen. In order to get that off the cell, there needs to be carbon dioxide present. So if you're overbreathing constantly and you're mouth breathing, there's too much oxygen available, your arteries and veins will actually vasoconstrict so that eventually carbon dioxide can get it off the cell. So overbreathing short circuits the system, and now you want to get back to that nasal breath. Again, slower, more restrictive, insert carbon dioxide, and now you become uh, more aerobically efficient. You become mechanically more sound, and it's very simple to change. And with our athletes, the first thing we do is solve your sleep. Everybody should solve your sleep first for optimal performance in general. But if your mouth breathing, your ability to get deeper into deeper REM sleep is restricted. Um, your recovery is restricted. And nobody wants, like, everybody, if you look at recovery from breath work, uh, that's the biggest change we've had for, with all of our athletes. But the biggest thing also is everybody wants to live optimally. That's why we're not even getting into optimal performance. You should solve your sleep first. How we do that is with the mouth tape. I don't know if anybody's done that. Anybody mouth tape when they sleep? Yeah, that's been the biggest game changer for our, all, all of our athletes because if you can start to develop these great breathing habits subconsciously, now we start pulling every breath during the day and rest into, into consciousness and we're out of time. So, um, 
I, I, I like sex, remember, right? John, come over here. Uh, Brian, I'm talking about 360 breathing. Do you guys know what that means? What a freaking moron, 360 breathing. <laughs> Typical football player with a free brain concussions, right? 360 means 360 all around it, okay? So if you take your next partner next to you, sex again, this is naked. We do it naked. Me and Brian did it. I mean, me and John did it this morning. And I asked John, up, oh, please. Okay. No. <laughs> If you take a deep breath, 360 means that this has to expand out. Go ahead, take a deep breath. He can't. He's not even touching it. He sh this should go move away from me. Try to do it again. All chest breathing. You guys see that? So that is tense, hard to sleep, headaches, all those things. So I need to do, John, I want you to look up. Open your mouth just slightly. Take a deep breath. Where was that? Where do you feel that more now? Yes, so just by doing that little trick to teach you a little bit of how to breathe, that's 360. This has to move. If you're not using this to, to breathe, it doesn't protect your spine, you're going to have back pain. So Brian, try to do it again, try to push me away. No. Nope. Come on. There we go. Now he's doing it, which is a little, thank you. That's a little trick that you need to do to help you breathe 360. 360 minutes all, all around. And before I'm done, any questions about anything we talked about today, please don't come and ask me 50 questions after we're done here. So ask a question now. Yes. Okay, so the, correct me if I'm wrong. The question is why I did it eccentrically. The reason is the fascia. The fascia is so connected. It has more nervous, more nervous system than the on spine. Let me repeat that. It has more nervous system. If you have the fascia and you open it, I, I put it, I cut it through the middle and I open it, it has a bunch of nerve. It's like a whole city. It's like New York City in there. Okay, if you train, we always, how do you guys sleep? With your legs bent, right? A lot of people will sleep. Always contracting. Do you guys, okay, I'm going to ask this question. Nobody raises their hand. I'm going to really piss. Who drives a car here? Thank you. Finally, damn it. Okay. When you drive a car, what are you doing? Sitting down. What's happening to your hamstrings? Shortening. One is shortening, one is lengthening. Okay? So let me repeat that. One, and then when you go sit down, you guys are sitting down, you're shortening your hamstrings. And shortening your psoas, which makes it harder for your hamstring to work. So that's what I do eccentric first, because I want to fix the fascia, then I worry about the muscle. Now, sometimes I have to do the muscle first and then do the fascia later. Now, somebody asked me, you know, if you don't have that little hammer crap, right, just use a dumbbell. They will, right? Keep it there. And you should be able to go parallel all the way. Got it? Any other questions? Yes, sir. Speak a little loud. I cannot hear you. That actually is a great question. He's asking me on the chin up in a straight bar, but if I'm doing a, a I'm assuming a, a V1, a parallel grip or whatever. Okay, first of all, the lat works in three different ways. I saw somebody yesterday here, I observed everybody doing... I'm going to call it mowers because it was mowing, right? The lat does not work on a parallel grip. The lat works this way, this way, and this way. When you're using a bar, where does the bar stop you? Right here. You cannot go past that, right? That affects your back and affects your obliques. When you're doing an exercise for your back or you're doing rows, you must engage the elbow. Think about pulling from the elbow, right? And you're going to pull. I'm not going to stop there. I got to go all the way back. If you guys sit up right straight, I want you guys to pull, and I want you guys to concentrate all the way back. Tell me what happens to your back. You guys feel it, don't you? And you feel your oblique. 
Now, I want you to do the same thing, but this time I want you to do this with your arm. Do it again. Does it feel from the same place? No, it does not, right? Now, if you do it this way, do it again. Try to engage that. Go all the way back. Do you see how it changes when your back feels it? So when you turn your back, you have to use all the grips because now your elbow gets affected. Now, on a straight bar, always use thumbless. On a dumbbell, you're okay. Okay? On a parallel grip, you're okay. This way, okay. Use thumbs. Now the elbow is free. Don't want to have pain. Got it? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, people kind of get that twisted because I preach nasal breathing when I go to p uh, speak to athletes and teams in general. I'll be out walking and looking at breathing while conditioning, and guys look at me and they Ryan, shut their mouth. Repeat, repeat the question. Uh, the, the question is whether to instruct somebody to n in, breathe into the nose and out through the nose while on the field, correct? Yeah. Um, it's, there's a gear shift system to it. Like, and all these breath work tools and the base fundamentals and all the mechanics and all these things are great off the field. We don't want to stress athletes out by giving them a bunch of breathing cues. We want to teach them in generality what's happening when they're inhaling, exhaling, and what part they're inhaling, exhaling through. It becomes, it becomes a gear shift system. So if you're mouth, mouth, like if you're fighting, I don't want you to worry about breath at all. Yeah, breathe in and out through your mouth. And when you can, get in, inhale through the nose, out through the mouth. That's a downshift. It's like driving a car. When you can, into the nose and out through the nose. And there's, there's other scales, too. You can extend the exhale out the mouth before you get to in the nose, out the mouth. Um, there's a bunch of tools. Like, you can steal from the free diving world and do really hard dumps and experiment with your athletes where um, when they get to those points, <sighs> do 10 hard dumps. Because CO2, when you get into the hypoxic world and the carbon dioxide starts pulling in your legs just when you're doing exhale, hold, walks, or the other end of the spectrum that I didn't talk about today, you'll feel the same thing as a burn from a, a run and those kind of things. So you understand carbon dioxide is an early trigger of this uh, muscle fatigue and lactic acid, acidosis that eventually happens. So you can get ahead of that with hard dumps. Like, just play with it. Experiment. Like, a lot of the breathing tools are, are by feel for person. But, no, you don't want an athlete to, unless you're training CO2 tolerance in particular, to run, run their sprints and immediately shut their mouth and go nasal breathing because that's the restriction and eventually you're just building up CO2 for that sake. But no, yeah, it's, it's all tools. We want guys for a chance to control their state. Because if you can control your breath and environment, you can own the environment concept. A lot of guys fail when they lose that regressive uh, nature to themselves. So, yeah, go ahead. You're talking about plantar fascia? So let, let me see if I rephrase your question. If I'm wrong, correct me. So your question is, if I'm doing, pla if I have someone with plantar, who has plantar fasciitis here? Oh, I love this. So, okay, the best way to do this is to show people, correct? How bad is your pain? Who has it? How bad is it? Seven out of 10. So plantar fasciitis is when you get up out of a chair or your bed and you step up that first morning, you can barely walk. Is that correct, what I'm assuming? How bad do you have it right now if you stand up? So he has a 5 out of 10. Lay down. Here we go. Sex again. On your back. On your back. So to explain, that was a great question, by the way. Your foot works how? Plantar flexion, right? What do we always train when you're a bodybuilder or you're a and you're a woman and you walk on your high heels, right? You want your calf to stick out, right? The problem with that is that we concentrate someone on the plantar flexor component that we forget the dorsiflexor component of it, right? So what happens when the rubber band that pulls you up is not as strong as the one that pushes you down? What happens? You start muscle, start having issues. The fascia again can do it, so you start doing this on the floor, watch. Slapping the floor which causes my, it's like a brain concussion. Now I'm creating a plantar concussion. So now I have a guy here, I never met him, so he has five out of 10, is that correct? So which one is it? Both. Both. 
So I'm going to pick the one with the less pain because that way I can tell you, oh, if I make a big difference on a big one with a big pain, then, oh, big deal. I want to make it on the one that has the least pain so you guys can see what happens. This is very easy. Now, plantar flexion versus dorsiflexion are different. There's dorsiflexion when elevation of the foot, and there's dorsiflexion when I'm actually pushing off, right? I want you to take your shoes off. Okay, I want to show you this. This is the domus. Domus. Freaking center never invented. If I was walking with this and I wouldn't wrap my toe around it, what would happen to the shoe? Will fly off. So what does the body do unintentionally? Wraps your finger to it, creating trauma to your fascia. <laughs> I'll slap this guy with this on my office, right? Because that's the first mistake he made. He come with, they look sexy, but they are not sexy at all, okay? So be aware of that. So this is, he got to go, because this is creating more pain. How long have you been using this? A couple months. Why? He makes it feel better because what he's doing is what? Wrapping his toe around it. Now, go ahead and uh-uh, bend your leg. Bring me your feet up. No, no, it's my fault. Only your foot. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to make him dorsiflex the leg. Don't let me push it down. Don't let me push it. Don't let me push it down. Okay? I'm going to do this five times. Only five times. In the, my office, I might do it longer depending on the amount of time that I have with that patient, okay? Don't let me push it down. Don't let me push you down. Come on, hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Don't let me push it down. By the way, as I do it, he has, how about is you losing strength? He's losing, it's getting weaker and weaker to the point. Go ahead, hold it up. That he's not even able to keep it up, right? I know you guys cannot see it, but I he cannot hold me now. That is a sign of a weakness that the dorsi component of it is not there. Leg straight. Okay, up again. Okay, now, uh, shit, how do we do this so people can see it? Can, I know you guys cannot see it. Oh, okay, good. So, I'm going to, again, dorsi flex with leg straight. I did it with the leg bending. Why? I want you guys to think about this question. Don't let me pull you down. Don't let me pull you down. Got it? There we go. Don't let me pull you down. Come on. Hold it. Oh, shit. Come on. Don't let me pull it down. Keep your toes up. One more time. Don't let me pull you down. He's grimacing. You see, guys, his face? Okay, one more time. I already heard a pop. Do you feel the pop? There was a pop. I already know he's better. But I'm going to make it one more time. Go ahead. Don't let me push you down. That was way better. Stand up. How's it feel? How much pain? From five to one. And I just did it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it like I'm supposed to do it. But I want you guys to show you a trick that you can use with your players. It works actually immediately. The more you do it, it will take the pain away within seven, 11 days. An easy way to train your dorsiflexion is by taking a dumbbell, holding it up, lifting it up. Got it? You just do that at home. I have, plant, I have plantar fasciitis. Let me balance it. Let me lift it up. Let me hold it. You should be able, a guy his size, a 65-pounder. Um, that's, I've seen it all the time. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So the question is, does having a stronger foot bridge, so he's talking about the arch, would make you have a higher chance of having plantar fasciitis? Or a high turnover? I don't know the answer. I never looked at it. When I look at runners, I had to look at the whole body. The best runners always have the highest calf, long tendon, and I usually are flat-footed, to be honest. Okay, so I do not know the answer to that, but give me three months and I'm sure I will have it. Okay, any, yes, sir. Um, 
Okay, so the question is, I cannot breathe through my nose. So Brian is full of shit, basically. That's what you're telling me. I agree with you. <laughs> now, stand up for a second. This is perfect. Every single patient that has nasal surgery in my office always has issues. Always. God is perfect. He didn't create turbines to have boogers or for us to play with our boogers. He created to filter the air, right? Now, the first question I'm going to ask this guy, have I ever met you? Okay, how much dairy do you eat? Yeah. So you don't drink whey proteins? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I'm brown skin or white skin? No shit, no. So he's dairy free, but he drinks whey proteins every day. Is he dairy free? No. <laughs> Hell no. Okay. Question number one. Question number two. Do you have oats or wheat? Sometimes. Do you have peanuts or peanut butter? Uh, finally, something that makes sense. Okay. On a personal thing, the first thing I would do, I completely eliminate dairy, oats and wheat and oatmeal are the four most common three most common components of nose issue. Number four, I will, if that doesn't work, I eliminate eggs and last, corn. By the way, oats are never gluten-free. It's a lie. I know it says gluten-free in every bullshit. It's a lie. Gluten is a number of family members, okay? We only check for one. They're gluten-agents, so there's about four types. Oatmeal is never gluten-free. If you truly have celiac or you have this, do not have oatmeal, okay? I will eliminate, truly eliminate dairy completely. I'll do that. Number two, where do you live? Okay, I'll buy raw honey. has to be raw and it has to be from that area. And you're going to take a tablespoon every single day and you're going to hold it in your mouth for at least 30 seconds. Hold it, hold it, hold it. You're going to swallow, you tilt your head back, and you're going to swallow. The reason I do that is because if he's allergic to pollen, what does honey, what do bees do? They go grab every single pollen around the area, they put on honey, that will train your immune system to prevent that. Another thing is I start taking vitamin C, six grams a day with dehydroquercetine. And I take 800 milligrams. That should help you a lot. I would like you to tell Bert what happens. Yes, any questions? I know there was two more up. Where was the other question? So it was back there. Okay, we're done, I guess. Thank you, guys.